Do you want a voiceover that sounds like this, but you're stuck with a mix that sounds like this? Stay tuned because I'm gonna show you how to get there. Hey guys, Joey here, and in today's video, I'm gonna pull back the curtains on voiceovers. You may not know it, but I actually make these videos in a lot of different locations. The room and the mics I have available aren't always what I use in the studio. That means that I have to have a really dependable mixing setup to meet my quality standards. I'm gonna show you this setup and recreate it in stock plugins in Reaper so that you have the best possible voiceover sound. Let's get started. Before a single line is recorded, you should take a look at the recording area. As a rule, smaller, well-treated rooms sound best for vocal recordings. This may seem daunting, but it's actually a lot easier to treat a room for vocals than it is for mixing. Part of the reason is because of the frequency response. The sub-information on vocals will be filtered out, which is great because treating bass is way more complicated than controlling high-end. Bass traps take up a lot of space and materials. Any kind of absorption material will help control the vocal sound. Foam, acoustic panels, or even dense furniture can be enough treatment for a voiceover. And another thing I'll mention is if you're recording somewhere like in a hotel room that is basically a box, you're going to be dealing with standing waves. A way to combat that is just take your bed off of the bed frame and put it up against the wall. The type of mic matters a lot. Dynamic mics are standard for broadcast and voiceover material. They pick up a lot of the low end of the human voice really well. They also tend to be a little more directional than a condenser mic. Condenser mics will pick up a lot of the fine details of the vocal, but also might be too bright for many applications. Because of the amount of detail, condenser mics are not usually recommended in large or untreated rooms. The early reflections are much more pronounced, which makes the recording sound noisy. If the vocal is being recorded over music or game audio, closed back headphones will help reduce the bleed. It might not be noticeable at first, but after some compression, this bleed can get really distracting. A pop filter is important for any vocal recording. Whether it's singing, screaming, or speaking, plosives that pop the mic are a distracting noise that should be reduced. The placement depends on the mic. Dynamic mics usually have the pop filters pretty close because of the proximity effect. Condensers will usually need to be a little bit further back. Now that the preparation is done, let's cover some recording tips. For a warm and full tone, it's usually best to get close to the mic, especially how close will depend on the mic, but I find around three to six inches works pretty well. The mic should be positioned away from tables, shelves, really anything that has the ability to reflect sound. This cuts down on early reflections and also keeps the signal to noise ratio higher. Try to be consistent with the volume of your voice. Consistency goes a long way towards a balanced sound. And try to limit background noise. Turn off fans, TVs, and other loud electrical devices. For example, I'm recording in my kitchen right now, so I turned off the refrigerator and also the furnace because the furnace fan was running. Make sure to be careful with keyboard noise. And if you're using a keyboard or mouse to start and stop the recordings, make sure that you don't click while speaking. These sounds are tough to separate from the vocal, so it's best to not cause them in the first place. Once the voiceover is recorded, it's time to edit it. Listen through the recording and cut out any distracting background noises, and listen for clicks, pops, and any slip-ups on the speech. Make sure to use fades so that the audio doesn't instantly cut in and out. This will take the listener out of the experience. If there's a hum or something consistent in the background, it may actually be worth recording some silence and replacing gaps in the speech with that noise. This really only applies if there's a noticeable difference between silence on the mic and silence in the DAW. If the speech is supposed to be synced to things happening on screen, make sure you have a copy of the video to reference. If the final product is going to be audio only like a video essay, then the lines don't really have to follow any specific cadence. When editing stuff like this, listen to how the words flow. Always remember to listen to the section before a cut to make sure that the sentences don't sound really choppy. One other thing to pay special attention to is crossfades. This can make a really smooth transitions between takes, but there are a few things to watch out for. The most obvious is repeated parts of words. If a fade is too long, the fade can be heard twice, like this. Breaths are also a common thing that's overlooked when crossfading. Make sure that the breaths don't start and stop at weird points. And just like the words, make sure that no breaths are doubled up. You might be tempted to just cut all the breaths in order to avoid this problem, but then that makes the recording feel pretty unnatural. If the breaths are distracting, then sometimes it's better to just reduce the volume rather than completely cut them out altogether. All right, the recording and editing is done. Now for the part that you've been waiting for, mixing. The mix on a voiceover is really important. Just like with music, it's important to keep a goal in mind. Most modern vocal mixes are really compressed and hyped, and there's usually a good amount of ambience. In a voiceover scenario, the goal is usually to make the audio sound natural and consistent. You might not think it should be processed at all, 
But the way that mics pick up speech is actually really not natural. The EQ and focus of a mic is different from the way that we hear voices in real life. I'm going to process this voiceover with noise reduction, EQ, compression, de-essing, and light limiting. Let's look at the noise reduction. Even if you've got a great recording, it can usually benefit from some form of noise reduction. Mouth noise, clicks, pops, and resonance will make the production sound amateur. There's a ton of ways to go about noise reduction, but I like to use algorithmic processors. They automatically find and reduce the noise. This is awesome because it does a lot of the work for you. A noise gate is also a great way to add clarity to a voiceover. By cutting out the background noise, it keeps the focus on the vocal. For stuff like this, I like to use a gate with a lower reduction range. This ducks the noise, but doesn't completely cut it out. Our brains get used to the noise floor in a recording, but when the noise starts and stops with the vocal, it can get distracting. Think of it like a crossfade. Rather than cutting to silence, a lower range will keep the noise manageable without distracting starts and stops. I'll also use some automatic noise reduction. D-clickers, D-hum, and D-noise plugins are great for cutting out little distractions in the recording. Unless there's a significant issue in the recording, it's best to keep these subtle. A lot of these plugins let you monitor the delta signal, which is the difference between the input and the output. Mess around with the order of these plugins. I'll usually gate pretty early on, but the resonance and noise reduction will be changed by compression. Try them in a few different orders. The EQ for a voiceover is usually pretty simple. Start with a high pass to filter out the low end. The voice doesn't have any sub information, so this will help clean up any low hum or noises. The second area where problems come up is around 250 hertz to 500 hertz. A lot of voices, especially male speech, tend to build up here, especially mine. Try a reduction of a few dB to get a little more clarity. A lot of mics pick up a little too much detail around 4K. If a vocal recording sounds harsh, this is a really good spot to check first. Just be careful, reducing this frequency range too much can kill the vocal presence. The last area to check out is the high band. Depending on the recording situation, a high shelf boost may be necessary. This is usually done when a dynamic mic was used. If there's any super high frequency noise, filtering down here should get it out of the way. After these basic moves, listen for any frequencies that are consistent throughout the whole take. These can be fatiguing frequencies for a listener. It's usually pretty easy to find them. Just take a super narrow Q band and sweep around until there's a frequency that won't go away, and then reduce it by a few dB. A little bit of compression goes a long way with voiceovers. I'll usually aim for a low ratio and fast attack to just bring in the peaks. This helps smooth out the vocal. If there's still dynamic movement, I'll run a second compressor. The gain structure is a little different with two compressors. The second one doesn't have to work as hard, so the results can be a little more transparent. I try to not overload any one compressor. I'm just aiming for a few dB of reduction on each. If you're using a condenser mic, chances are there's a lot of S's in the vocals. These are super annoying, especially if there's no other sound going on. A de on subtle settings should get most of those out of the way. The goal is to get natural sibilance by dynamically reducing the high band. If the EQ has a high shelf boost and the vocal is compressed, there's probably too much sibilance being brought up. Mess with the threshold and frequency until the S's are ducked, but not so much that it's distracting. And believe me, you don't want to do too much de because you can really easily make someone sound like they have a lift. Limiting the voiceover chain is a great way to get the volume needed while also making sure that the dynamics are consistent. They tend to be more transparent than a compressor, which makes it a good choice for spoken word. I'll usually throw on Finality or JW Bus Glue vocals on the end of a voiceover chain. All right, that's my voiceover chain, but what if you don't have the plugins that I'm using? You can get great results with your DAW stock plugins. Reagate can be made more subtle by bringing up some of the dry signal back in and adjusting the attack and release. Listen to how the signal is reduced but not completely gated. Joey Sturgis Tones. Joey Sturgis Tones. The EQ moves can be done with pretty much any equalizer. Joey Sturgis Tones. Joey Sturgis Tones. Every DAW has a compressor, so let's use some similar settings here. Joey Sturgis Tones. Joey Sturgis Tones. Finally, let's apply the limiter to control the overall level. Joey Sturgis Tones. Joey Sturgis Tones. Awesome, that sounds great. I've shared the stock settings as a Reaper template. Link is in the description below. What really makes a difference here is how the recording is prepped and what settings are being used to process it. Nice plugins can help save time, but with a little extra work, anything can be used to get this result. Do you make voiceovers? What projects are you recording them for? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, hit that subscribe button. 
Don't forget to check the links in the description below and tap that bell to get notified whenever we upload new videos. Until next time, happy mixing. Thank you.